Welcome to Tiny Desk Concerts here at NPI in Washington, D.C. All my life I've been Robin Hitchcock, and uh, tonight I'm doing a show with Joe Boyd, who's been Joe Boyd even longer than I've been me. <laughs> One of the reasons I am Robin Hitchcock, and I still wear my uh, rose-colored glasses with pride is because I came from the 1960s, direct. As a lad, I listened to records produced by Joe, including uh, Pink Floyd, The Incredible String Band, Nick Drake, Fairport Convention, and now, after a lifetime in the music business, uh, Joe and I are touring um, with him reading his stories, episodes from how he first ran across these people and how they magnetized him and what he did with them. And uh, my role in this is to sing the songs that I heard as I was magnetized as a kid. So in that vein, this is the first song by Sid Barrett. Uh, it's called Terrapin. And Joe will tell you about his time with Sid after I've played it. What a nice thing to say about somebody. My hair is on end about you. Um, the first, I think actually this was 
either one of the first or the first times that Robin and I worked together was um, in the some months after Sid Barrett died, and I was asked to help organize a tribute concert at the Barbican in London, and it forced me to do something that I hadn't done for many, many years because when I worked with Sid, which was quite brief at the very beginning of Pink Floyd's career, he was this bright-eyed, funny, witty, delightful guy who was just so, so, such a pleasure to work with. And when his solo records came out after he left the Floyd, you know, you, they put in little snatches of conversation, talk back between the engineer and, and Sid, and he just sounded so damaged. And the way he sang was just so, it was, you know, I mean, I know people love the records, but I just had, I listened to them once when they came out and then put them away and didn't listen to them again because I found it quite painful. And so when um, we were organizing this concert, I had to go back and listen to everything. And... I was just stunned, you know, songs like Terrapin, which I'd heard once and never remembered, just amazed me as how, how the quality of the songwriting. Anyway, for this, I wrote a little um, thing for the program for this concert. Um, and it's very much a London point of view because, you know, there was something about Sid and that summer of from between 66 and 67, that whole year, that um, he was very important, as, as, as I'll explain. Sid Barrett tried to set us free. So many things are impossible to imagine without Sid. The year of our glorious psychedelic revolution began in August of 66, with Pink Floyd playing those London free school benefits in Power Square. It ended with Sid on stage the following July, hands at his side, motionless, watching the lights play over the UFO audience, listening to the group behind him, struggling to fill the void. Sid was beyond caring then. But Sid was always beyond caring in the best possible way. Sid's brilliant unconcern kept everyone around him honest. He didn't care about stardom didn't care what the record company wanted or the agency or how the press or the fans told him he ought to do it. When Sid joined what was supposed to be a blues band, he gave them a name borrowed from two, two obscure blues singers discovered deep in the liner notes to a Blind Boy Fuller album. No one now knows what Pink Anderson or Floyd Council sounded like. but his oblique appropriation of their names provided this Cambridge outfit with a perfect handle. Their first job in London was to provide the soundtrack to a film by a London painter consisting entirely of abstract shapes. Light played across the screen as they recorded their score. They liked the combination of their music and colored lights. The accident of that commission providing one of the key elements of psychedelic London in the Summer of Love, 1967. David Bowie, says that Sid changed his life by the way he sang Arnold Lane, just the way he talked, not trying to sound black or American or cool, just sounding like himself, singing about the way the lodger's knickers used to go missing in the Barrett backyard. Sid certainly changed the life of his fellow Floyds. He gave them escape velocity. Long after he was gone, his way with a chord and a melody shaped their music and their triumphs. They sang about him over and over again to the millions of fans who knew the name but never heard the voice. Last summer after he died, Radio 4 aired a tape of Sid being cross-examined on an arts program on television. Forget those snatches of Sid's voice you hear on CD bonus outtakes. Sid sounded nothing like that in the spring of 1967. He answered questions like a man bo born to be a radio pundit, clear and calm, with no mumbled ums or errs. The interview was filmed a few weeks before Sid changed, before he altered himself into the damaged person we now think of when we think of Sid. I remember that voice, the calm Sid voice, not upset that an ignorant interviewer doesn't understand the Floyd's music, perfectly at home explaining the logic of rock and roll volume levels 
as if he were talking to a child. You can't really analyze how Sid changed everything just by being Sid. But when I think back to that year in which I knew him, I can feel his ripples. Everyone at that er those early Floyd shows was just a bit different afterwards. You could sense it in the streets of Notting Hill Gate. The crowds at the early UFO shows were so happy that Sid was there in front of him. So many things were changing by the week, but Sid remained untouched. The still center around which the hurricane blew. His unconcern was the key, the way his songs were so casually offered. Which isn't to say he didn't yearn. He yearned for love and companionship, and he was unashamed about it. Everyone yearns. He just stated it as a simple, obvious fact. In the song Bike, he says, you're the kind of girl that fits in with my world. I'll give you anything, everything, if you want things. If you want things. Sid had nothing against people wanting things. He just didn't seem too bothered about them himself. In 1967, we thought we were at the beginning of something, something really big. We didn't realize we were nearing the end. Everything we created in those years of optimistic freedom wound up on a corporate website. I think Sid saw it coming, like the small animal that runs out of the forest two days before the earthquake. Tonight, with our eyes wide open, we are commodifying Sid's songs. We can't help ourselves. It's the only way we know how to reassure ourselves we really loved him. If we're very lucky, there may come a moment tonight when performer and audience stop caring whether anyone likes it or remembers it or knows we were hip enough to be here. Maybe for an instant we'll just be there as if no one had ever done a tribute concert before. Sid won't know or care, but perhaps we'll walk just a tiny bit differently as we leave. Another artist that has been the subject of dialogue and work with me and Robin is uh, Nick Drake, and we've worked together on a series of concerts in, uh, in Europe called Way to Blue, which a number of different singers and a, a group and strings uh, perform original arrangements of Nick's songs, and people sing those songs and take some liberty sometimes with some of those. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the book about Nick, and then... Um, there's a lovely moment at the end of the concert, just towards the end of the concert, when uh, Robin sings uh, the song you'll hear in a minute. Glasses. Uh, hello? The voice on the other end of the line was low and soft, almost embarrassed. In the years to come, I would get used to Nick Drake's way of answering the telephone as if it had never rung before. When I told him why I was calling, he was surprised. Uh, okay, uh, I'll bring it in tomorrow. He appeared at my office the next morning in a black wool overcoat stained with cigarette ash. He was tall and handsome with an apologetic stoop. Either he had no idea how good looking he was or was embarrassed by the fact. He handed me the tape and shuffled out the door. When I had some peace and quiet later that winter afternoon, 1968, I put the reel-to-reel -reel tape on the little machine in the corner of my office. The first song was not one of his best. I was made to love magic. The sentimental chord at the beginning of the chorus became one of the few moments in a Nick Drake song that ever annoyed me. But that was the first time, that was the first time it drew me in. It was, after all, the first Nick Drake song I'd ever heard. Next came the thoughts of Mary Jane, then time has told me. I played the tape again, then again. The clarity and strength of the talent were striking. There was something uniquely arresting in Nick's composure. The music stayed within itself, not trying to attract the listener's attention, just making itself available. His guitar technique was so clean, it took a while to realize how complex his playing was. Influences were detectable here and there, but the heart of the music was mysteriously original. Nick came in the next day and listened as I explained what I wanted to do. He nodded and stammered, staring down at his hands, then asked whether I minded if he smoked. I couldn't take my eyes off his hands. They were huge, stained with nicotine, 
the fingers strong and articulate, with long, evenly trimmed nails caked with grime. He moved them constantly as he listened to my plans for him. One evening, Nick played me all his songs. Up close, the power of his fingers was astonishing, with each note ringing out loud, almost painfully so, and clear in the small room. I had listened closely to Robin Williamson, John Martin, Bert Chance, John Renborn. Half-struck strings and blurred hammerings on were an accepted part of the sound. None could match Nick's mastery of the instrument. After finishing one song, he would retune the guitar and proceed to play something equally complex in a totally different chord shape. 60s London was not brimming with good arrangers. George Martin did his own, Denny Cordell and Mickey Most used John Cameron, but I felt he would have been too jazzy. I rang Peter Asher at Apple and asked him about Richard Hewson, who'd worked on the first James Taylor record. Peter spoke well of him and gave me his phone number. I sent him a tape of three songs. We paid him a visit. Nick looked at his shoes a great deal, muttered agreements to things I had said. It must have been painful for him to go through this process, knowing that Robert Kirby was back in Cambridge. But I never thought to ask who'd written the arrangements for the May Ball that Nick told me about, and Nick didn't volunteer. In those pre-computer days, there was no way to hear an arrangement before recording it. On the day of the session, Nick, engineer John Wood, and I sat in the control room as the musicians rehearsed their parts, trying to imagine how they would sound without, with the songs. When Nick joined them in the studio, I listened as carefully to his performance as to the instruments. I needn't have bothered. Nick was perfect every time. The arrangements, on the other hand, were competent, mediocre, and slightly fey, distracting from the songs rather than adding to them. After we listened back to our morning's work, I admitted it hadn't worked. Nick breathed a sigh of relief. You could see how wary he was of complaining. After a silence, he said, I know someone at Cambridge who might be able to do the job. John and I looked at him. He's already done some arrangements for my songs. They, uh, well, they're not too bad. I wasn't sure what to make of Nick's suggestion. I wanted a world-class production. So the idea of using a fellow student stuck, struck me as a step backwards. Yet for the supremely cautious Nick to recommend his friend was impressive. I agreed to drive up to Cambridge the following week to meet Robert Kirby. What can you tell about a musician from meeting him? Kirby was hearty and jolly like a young music tutor. But beneath the banter, there was no hiding his deep affection for Nick and his music. I liked the way they were at ease together. When Robert talked about his songs, he was down to earth and practical. Encouraged, I set a date for the recording. They started the session with a song I hadn't heard before because Nick didn't play it on the guitar. As John Wood isolated the sound of each instrument, adjusting the mic position or the equalization, I could barely contain my impatience to hear the full sextet. The individual lines were tantalizing, unusual, and strong. When at last John opened all the channels and we heard Robert's full arrangement of Way to Blue, I almost wept with joy and relief. Um, yes, this is by me, but it's called I Saw Nick Drake. So when we do the Way to Blue show, this is the first encore.
my sonic tray I saw him wave Thanks for having us. It was, it was, it was Joe Boyd and Robin Hitchcock, live and direct from the 1960s. <laughs>